This is the story of Kenneth Randall, M.D. Kenneth Randall is more than a mere character of fiction. He is the personification of the spirit, the ideals, the disappointments, the sacrifices, the struggles, and the hopes of literally hundreds of physicians who throughout the years saw and what's more did something about the needs for advancement in industrial medicine. Dr. Kenneth Randall, you're a very wonderful man. Mm, that's right. And come to think of it, you're a very, uh, well, to say the least, a very brave young woman, Mrs. Randall. Brave? Why do you say that? Why? Because you married me. <laughs> oh, but don't misunderstand. Actually, you have a wonderful catch in me. A brilliant young surgeon, fresh from an exciting career as an underpaid intern. <laughs> but ready now to conquer the medical world and lay it at your feet. Ah, yes, I can see it all now. A huge banquet. All the prominent medical men in the country gathered to pay honor and tribute to Dr. Kenneth W. Randall. World renowned. Famous for his great contributions to, uh, to, uh, mm, uh, well, something or other. Of course, she'll be there, too, as my proud little wife. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Mm -hmm. Ah, I can hear me now. As I stand to accept the tremendous ovation and make my acceptance speech. All that I am, or ever hope to be, I owe to my little wife. Bravo, bravo! <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me, Ken, if you're such a wonderful catch, why am I so brave to marry you? Because you didn't wait until I became a success. You married me now. Before I even have an office of my own. I should call sharing one with Dad an office. Before I even had my first regular patient. A patient? Hello. Uh, there's, there's nobody there. No wonder there's no one there. That's the doorbell ringing. Here's your robe. Oh, thank you, dear. Get there. Quick, Doc. Bill's hurt bad. Bleeding like anything. I'll be back in a minute. Darling, it was a patient. One of the workmen was hurt over at the mill. Oh. 
I'll get your clothes. We can get there quicker if we cut across. We'll take that, car. Yeah. for disinfect. Sure, that's what we always do. Cobwebs for the bleeding and chewing tobacco for disinfect. Here, let me in there. Yes, sir. We have to get this man to a hospital, quickly. Easy, take it easy there. This is your chart. Here. Has my son come in yet, Miss Lane? No, he hasn't, Dr. Randall. Oh, here he is now. Good morning, Dad. Good morning, Miss Lane. Good morning. Say, Ken, I uh, looked in on that new patient of yours just now. A fellow from the mill. I hope you don't mind. Gosh, no, Dad. What'd you think about him? Looks like he'll be all right. Husky fellow, you did a fine job. Splendid piece of surgery. <laughs> well, like father, like son, I hope, Dad. That'll take years of hard work. By the way, you'd better accustom yourself to addressing me as doctor, especially around the hospital. I'll do the same. Very well, Dad. Uh, doctor. Excuse me, Dr. Monroe left this for you to look at before you leave. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, I've been thinking. They have quite a number of accidents over there at the mill. I remember as a kid, you were always treating somebody from there, fixing a broken arm or something. Yes, my fees from that mill alone probably put you through medical school. I've been wondering if something couldn't be done about that. The accidents at the mill, I mean. It seems to me that... Well, I doubt if anything can be done about it. There are always accidents, especially in a mill. Men grow careless, something goes wrong with the machinery. Well, I don't know, it doesn't seem right to me. Isn't it part of a doctor's job to do everything he can to prevent accidents and sickness, as well as to cure them? Of course, but within reason. You can't close every mill and factory in town. Now, you just concentrate on being a good surgeon and don't worry about anything else. Dr. Randolph, they're waiting for you in the operating room. Thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, tell Martha I'll be dropping in for dinner tonight. See you in just a moment. Mason, what's the matter with you fellows over there at the plant? I thought I told you to come in and have this hand dressed every day. Johnson's as bad as you are. His wound should be dressed every day, too. Yet he hasn't been in for a week. Ah, you fellows at the plant are all alike. Gosh, Doc, it ain't so easy. We work all day and at night. Well, it seems when we get home, get cleaned up and have our supper, well, I don't know. It seems there just ain't no time for running to the doctor. I have an idea. What time do you fellows quit for lunch? About 11.30. Perhaps if you men can't find the time, maybe I can. How would it be if I came over to the plant tomorrow at 11.30? Gee, do you think you could do that, Doc? Gosh, if you can come over to the plant, That'll help things out a lot. All right. Say, Doc, mm -hmm. I wish you'd kind of take a look at my back. It seems to be hurting all the time. Sure, I'll take a look at it. 
So, uh, slip your shirt off, will you? There you are, Jim. That ought to pick you up. Okay, Doc. Thanks a lot. Now, well, that's it. Now, let's see. Where does it hurt? Here? Ah, hurt you there, huh? Do you do much lifting, Judd? Most all the time, Doc. <laughs> You'd think I'd be used to it, wouldn't you? How long has your back been hurting you? Well, for several months, off and on. But lately, it's been hurting most of the time. Well, how about getting transferred to some other kind of job? A job where you wouldn't have to do any lifting? Why, I've had lifting jobs all the time. Well, if you keep on lifting, Judd, that pain in your back's going to get worse. You'll be laid up, maybe for a long time. Now, my advice is go see your family doctor as soon as you're through work this afternoon. Get him to give you back a thorough examination and see what he advises you to do. Well, all right if you say so, but I thought maybe you could give me something to rub in and take the pain away. That wouldn't do any good, Judd. Now, don't put off seeing your doctor. Go see him as soon as you're through work today, will you? Well, all right if you say so. Got a little cut in my arm, Doc. Did it this morning. As long as you're going to be around here, I thought maybe you'd take a look at it. Mm -hmm. It ain't much. Yep. This morning, eh? Mm -hmm. well, let's see here. Did you dress this yourself? Yeah. I see. Sit down here, Bill. Bill, you fellas ought to have a first aid kit around here. Yeah, except we wouldn't know how to use it. Well, I'd be glad to teach somebody to give first aid treatment. Come in handy in cases like this. Say, Art. Yeah, Bill? Come on over here. Art's always around helping when anyone's hurt. He'd be a good one to teach first aid to. What's up? Hello, Doc Randall. Hello. Doc here wants to know if you want to be his assistant. <laughs> Bill suggested that you might be interested in learning a little about giving first aid in cases like this. Yeah, that'd be all right. Well, fine. I'll leave some iodine and some bandages and a few... Uh, so, yeah. How about putting stuff in here? I don't use this box anymore. Yes, that'll make quite a medical department. Yes, quite a medical department. One morning, about three weeks later, Dr. Randall Sr. was reading a newspaper. What he saw didn't exactly please him. Say, Ken. <clears throat> oh, hello, Martha. Kenneth, listen to this. Worker threatened suit for alleged back injuries. Decision to sue based on diagnosis of Dr. Kenneth Randall. Well, I hope you realize a thing like that can cost us every good patient we have. I've spent years trying to build up a dignified and successful practice, and then you come along and get yourself mixed up in a thing like this. Oh, son, I wish you hadn't done it. But, Dad, what would you have me do? I suggested he see his own doctor and take his advice. Anything wrong with that? What I mean is you should have stayed away from the factory in the first place. And, Kenneth, I'm going to seriously suggest that from now on, you do your practicing in this office. Or the hospital surgery. That's your number one responsibility. And stay away from factories. That's not the life for you. Martha, I'll drop in for dinner tonight. Oh, fine. Martha. I've always felt that for a man to be a success in his own eyes, He's got to be more than just a competent member of his profession. I don't quite see what you're getting at. Oh, I mean, to be really successful, or maybe I should say worthy, uh, a carpenter, a toolmaker, engineer, preacher, or a doctor should contribute something to the advancement of human progress through his profession. Maybe it's just finding new ways to make something better or cheaper. Maybe it's fighting and working unselfishly for a just cause. Ken, you sound just like a high school valedictorian. <laughs> well, maybe so, but, but I mean it. 
And as far as I'm concerned, I'm beginning to think that, that my job is doing something for the advancement of, of a new kind of medical practice. New? In what way? Well, new from the point of view of a doctor, working to cut down sickness and accidents in the towns, factories, and mills. Yes, I, I suppose you could call it the, the practice of industrial medicine. But Ken, you know what your father will say. What's more important, Martha? What do you say? All that I am, or ever hope to be, I owe to my wife. In that case, I'd better do all I can to help in whatever job you undertake. How are you going to go about it? Well, right now, I don't know. I really don't know. But I'm going to do something. Doctor, Mr. Gregg and I have been talking over the idea of your coming into the plant for a regular period each day. I must say, the idea of a doctor in a factory seems quite unusual to me. Say the least. Sit down, Doctor. No, gentlemen, there's nothing new about a doctor in industry. And I've been interested in the idea for some time. So when you said you wanted to see me, I came right over. We heard about you treating some of the men during their lunch hour. We think maybe we can carry the plan a little further. Frankly, that was what I hoped you had in mind when you called me. You see, for the past several months, I've been doing quite a good deal of research and study on the subject of, well, I call it industrial medicine. I've been trying to find out what's already been done by others. It's been most revealing. And I might add, at times, a bit discouraging. As I said, the idea isn't exactly new. People have been trying to do something about industrial medicine for hundreds of years. Only, for the most part, very little progress has been made. But now the states are passing these workmen's compensation laws. That takes care of it, doesn't it? No, not exactly, Mr. Gregg. Industrial medicine stresses the preventive side of sickness and accidents in, in the factories, the mines, and the mills. Dr. Randall, as far as we're concerned here in this plan, just what would you propose specifically? I've worked out a rather complete program. I think this would be a good start. First, the program would include a complete physical examination for every employee, a permanent and well-equipped first aid station in the plant. Third, there should just also be... a minute. Be <laughs> You know, we're running a factory here, not a hospital. I'm afraid your ideas are a little too ambitious for us, Doctor. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I only... Now, uh, hold on, Sam. One or two of the suggestions you have here are well worth considering, Doctor. In other words, I think we can go along at least part way with you. Anyway, for a start. Now, here's what I suggest. Beginning next Monday morning, you'll make regular calls here at the plant say, from 10 to 12. And we'll fix up a place for you to work. And I think there's merit in this idea of the first aid station. Don't you, Sam? Well, it might work out as a good investment at that. Save a lot of production time and keep the men on the job. And as far as examinations are concerned, well, we'll talk about that later. What do you say, Doctor? All I can say is it's a big step in the right direction. And now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I have a few calls to make. Of course. Good day, Doctor. Good day. Doctor. You know, I just got an idea. There might be some advantages in this idea of physical examinations at that. At least for new employees. I'm glad you think so. Sure. A physical examination would weed out a man like Harris in the beginning. If they're unfit and can't do the work, why, let him get a job someplace else. Save us a lot of grief. Well, I don't think that's quite what the doctor or I had in mind. Anyway, I think we'll adopt the pre-employment examination plan and give it a try. Better call the doctor and tell him we've decided on examinations, too. Too much dry mustard for Dad, Ken. Yeah, I know. Not too much vinegar. Mm. Well, if I do say so myself, it's just the way Dad likes it. Say, darling, you know, this is really a celebration tonight. 
Old man Duncan accepted my ideas. Well, some of them anyway. I begin making regular calls at the factory on Monday. Oh, darling, you're wonderful. They even decided to try pre-employment physical examination. First, they wouldn't go for that part at all. Couldn't see the advantages. Well, tell me, Dr. Randall, just what are the advantages of uh, physical uh, examinations for the employees? Why, gentlemen, they're obvious. In the first place, they protect the worker from himself. In other words, some people have ailments they don't even suspect. In that case, I'll advise them to go to their own doctors for treatments. But that's only one of the advantages. The examination also protects fellow workers from communicable diseases and so forth. But it's just as important to get people placed on jobs they're physically capable of doing. This way, we can make allowances for anybody with a physical handicap. Not just put them on any old job. At least it's the ideal way. Well, it's more than that. Seriously, Martha, I think it's a practical way to cut down on sickness and accidents due to putting some poor fellow on the wrong kind of a job. A fellow's healthy, he's happy. And if a man's happy in his job, then... That's dead. Now, Ken, whatever you do, don't talk about your industrial medicine during dinner. <laughs> okay, sweet, I won't start an argument. Kenneth? Yes, Dad? I had a phone call this afternoon. It was meant for you. Well, that's not unusual, Dad. We often get our calls mixed. This was Sam Gregg at the factory. Oh, well, he probably wanted Won't to know about... Won't you have about... some more coffee, huh? Ken? Oh, no thanks, Bob. I uh, gather from what he said, you decided against my advice. You're going to be Kenneth Randall, the factory doctor. Well, I'll admit it doesn't sound very fancy. Well, does that mean that you're giving up your practice? Just as you're beginning to make a name for yourself? Certainly not. I'm merely going to expand. I'll only be at the factory for a few hours each morning. Expand in a factory? What about your regular patients? You can hardly expect them to come to a doctor who's out wrapping sore fingers in a factory. Dad, you don't seem to see what it is I'm trying to do. It's, it's what you call industrial medicine. Yes, I know. All very fine and noble. But that's not the job for you. Leave it for someone else who can pay the price. You concentrate on being a good surgeon. What do you mean, pay the price? Do you think patients like Mrs. Carter Wellman will want a factory doctor for their physician? Somehow, Dad, I don't care what Mrs. Carter Wellman or anyone like her thinks. Well, I do. I've spent years making my name an important one in the medical profession. Not only in this town, but throughout the state. I've looked forward to the day when I could hand my practice over to you. And I can't conceive of you are deliberately throwing away an opportunity like this for the doubtful security of becoming a salaried member of a factory staff. I can think of no better way for you to tear down the work I've done and besmirch the name I'm proud of. It's my name, too, Dad. And I certainly have no intention of besmirching it in any way. Frankly, I don't see... Well, you should see. I've told you often enough. If you don't care anything about yourself, your practice, or me, then think of Martha. You owe something to her. But, Father, I advise Ken to go ahead with what he wanted to do. Well... Well, you can't be blamed for that. You didn't know. But do you realize what people will say? They'll call him an unethical incompetent who couldn't get by in private practice. That's what they'll say. There's nothing unethical about the work of a good factory doctor. You know that, Dad. I do not. In my personal opinion, the whole idea is unethical. Why? Because you think it's new, untried? Not only that. You'd be working with some other doctor's patients. You couldn't steal them all away. Well, that's not fair, Dad. I never interfere with another doctor's private practice, and you know it. Well, yes. But I'd be the only one who does know it. And here's something else. You or no other man can serve two masters. What do you mean by that remark? You can't be loyal to your patients and at the same time be loyal to the man who's paying you a salary. And believe me, there'll be many times when you'll have to make decisions based on that very thing. I'll bet you never even thought about that. No, I haven't thought about that. I haven't had to. 
Well, you will. Mark my words. Well, when I do, my first allegiance will be to my patients, to humanity, to the community. What about Duncan and his stockholders? Don't forget, they'll be paying you. You'll be working for them. I don't consider it that way. Well, then on top of everything else, you're not even being honest with yourself. Oh, yes, I am. By basing my decisions on what's best for my patients, the community, and then the plant, in the long run, I'll do a better job of serving Mr. Duncan and the stockholders. Don't just see, Dad. I sincerely believe in the idea of industrial medicine. Not only in this town, but in thousands of plants all over the country. Well, that's not up to you to worry about. That's up to the men who run the factory. No, you're wrong, Dad. Industry wants help. They don't want just surgical repair, men, they want... Don't say anything, Ma. I can see that you're determined, in spite of my disapproval and disappointment. And nothing I can say will dissuade you. I'm afraid not. Well, we can no longer share the same office. I'm sorry, Dad. Good night, Mother. Oh, Dad, you don't mean... Yes, dear. I'm afraid I do. And this was only the first of the many bitter disappointments, conflicts, and sacrifices that came to the young doctor who had made his decision to become an industrial physician. Most of the conflict, like the basis of all trouble, was just misunderstanding. In the beginning, the workers themselves resented the physical examinations, and many submitted only under protest. Some of the foremen were short-sighted and resisted special job placement recommendations for handicapped employees. They said, I'll let him stick to his pill. We'll run the plant. We'll place the men where we decide. And while time solved most of the old problems, it also brought many new ones. For instance, there were cases where a man was suddenly taken sick on the job. Naturally, he was brought to the doctor in the plant. What happened, boys? I don't know. He just fainted. OK, thanks. This is when the health record made out at the time of employment examination proved its value as an aid in diagnosis. But here, the illness had no relation to the job. Treatment in this case was outside the responsibility of the plant doctor. This was a case for the employee's private physician, providing the man had one. Yes, this was a problem. Often, too, the man would say, You know all about my case, Doc. You're here all the time. You might as well continue the treatment. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid not. And if the doctor did take the case, he was accused of using his factory job to acquire patients for his own private practice. Right, doctor. Call him an unethical incompetent and never be able to steal them all. You or no other man. Serve two masks with that thing I want. But Father, I advised Ken to go ahead with what he wanted to do. But then gradually, things began to work out a little more smoothly. The workers and their families began to recognize the true benefit and respond to the sincerity, the medical skill, the ethical practices, civic cooperation, and the good judgment of the factory doctor. And even the other doctors in town were beginning to realize that instead of stealing patients away, Dr. Randall was actually sending more and more of them to their own physicians. They gradually realized that Dr. Randall was not only improving the health conditions in the factory, but working for the benefit and general health of the community as a whole. Slowly, the cloud of misunderstanding was beginning to lift. But then came 1914. So, like thousands of other young physicians, Kenneth Randall answered his country's call. Why, you 
sure look fine, Doc. And we're mighty glad to have you back. It goes without saying that I'm glad to be back. Well, it took the war to make us realize that industrial medicine represents another one of the many major problems that we manufacturers still have to solve. Our medical center was busier than ever before while you were away. Miss McDonald did an excellent job, too. She's a mighty fine nurse. Yes, she is. I'd like to keep her on, maybe full time. Because if it's all right with you, Mr. Duncan, from now on, during most of the time I do spend here in the plant, I want to concentrate in the industrial hygiene phase. There's a big job to be done in that field. Well, there's plenty of time to think about all that later. We'll be glad to pick up just where you left off. You know, just give us a few hours a day like you used to. Good. Right now, let's go out to the shop. Fine. The boys will be glad to see you. I'm anxious to see them. The World War had been over for 14 years. But as the time slipped by, the only contact between Kenneth Randall and his father had been through Martha's regular visits with the still embittered elder doctor. Yes, father. Right after the war, things were a lot different. But as you know, Ken started right in and worked harder than ever in his private practice, as well as in his industrial medicine. Well, things had changed a lot, and he didn't have quite as many difficulties as he'd had in the pre-war days. But there was one thing that still troubled him. What was that? Well, shortly after he came back from France, he was interviewing applicants for jobs at the plant. There was a young returned soldier in his office who had come to Ken with a problem. So you were in the Battle of Amman, huh? Sure was. That's how I picked up this shrapnel. And, Doc, I just got to have a job. It seems that every place I go, they hang out the no help wanted sign. Yes, I know. Only hiring able-bodied men, they tell me. All I know is factory work. They could use me somewhere, someplace. I think so. I think perhaps our employment office can arrange something where you'll be sitting down when you work. Now, I've written some instructions on this card. You take this down to the personnel office. Gee, thanks, Doc. Good luck, and drop in to see me. I'm sorry, soldier. Really, I am. You were sitting down along with the others when I was handing out the applications. I didn't notice your cane, or I could have told you then. Could have saved you the bother. But the doctor said Unfortunately, that... Unfortunately, the doctor doesn't make the rules. Nor do I, for that matter. I'm sorry. Keep your chin up, boy. You'll find something. Something besides factory work. Well, from then on, Ken seemed to feel that rehabilitation of the returned soldier was his personal problem. He did everything possible to help solve it. But at that time, there wasn't very much he could do. Yes, I, I know about that. So then, as the years went by, he spent more and more time working on the problems of his industrial medicine. And less and less time on the problems of developing a successful private practice. That was a shame. No, he was doing something he felt was needed. He used to stay up till all hours of the night studying. Studying books on the causes and prevention of occupational diseases. And even books on factory engineering. He spent a lot of time visiting different plants in all parts of the state. Studying the health conditions of the workers. Taking samples of dust. Of oil bringing them back to his little office laboratory, making chemical analyses, experimenting. Later on, he made speeches and read papers on the history of occupational diseases to gatherings of industrialists and physicians. And Father Ken has made a success of his life and the work he wanted to do. Why, today he's considered almost an authority on industrial medicine. But he would have made such a fine surgeon. That's the success I always wanted for Ken. He is a fine surgeon. What I mean is, well, with his hands and brain, he could have been... Oh, well, what's the use of talking? Father, 
Ken and I are leaving the city. We're going to move. And try to build up a practice somewhere else? It's too late for that now. That's positively insane. No, Ken is giving up his practice. He's been offered a position with a large automobile manufacturer. Dad, that's what he's been wanting all his life. A chance to work out his plans and theories in a large organization. There's so much he wants to do. A full-time factory, Doctor, eh? Well, that's the last straw. My son, a full-time factory, Doctor. Won't you come home and have dinner with Ken and me tonight? Please. Well, Martha, I haven't been in your house in a good many years. Now it's too late. You tell Ken. Tell him I wish him luck. Once again, the world was at war. The time was 1942, and Dr. Randall had been called into the office of one of the company's executives. Well, thanks. But what's this for? Why, Doctor, don't you know what day this is? No, I'm afraid I don't. I was looking over some records this morning. I discovered that this is your 10th anniversary with us. You did a fine job, Doctor, during those first three years of the divisions. And I'm speaking for all of us when I say you've done a superb job during the past seven, since you've been directing the medical activities of the entire corporation. Thank you. I've had a lot of fine cooperation from the company. But now the war means we have a bigger job ahead of us. Employment is still on the increase. And with the tremendous demands of our war effort, it's more important than ever that we keep our people healthy. That's really what I wanted to see you about. Doctor, what I want to ask you is how, from a medical standpoint, are we prepared for this work that's ahead of us? As a matter of fact, we're in fine shape. We've made tremendous strides in all of our divisional medical departments. You know, even if we had known what was going to happen throughout the world, we couldn't have made better preparations during these last years. Let me explain what I mean. Right today, we have plenty of facilities and equipment to make thorough examinations. We have adequate examination rooms for both men and women. X-ray machines to ensure careful examinations of the lungs. We have completely equipped consulting rooms. And we are gradually attaining our goal of full-time staffs of nurses and technical assistants in all plants. We have fully equipped laboratories for analysis. Years ago, we found out the importance of a good filing system, whereby the medical record, the medical history of every employee can always be kept up to date. Time and time again, an up-to-date medical history has proved invaluable, both to the doctor and to the patient. We learn, too, the importance of having the therapeutic, the treatment rooms, entirely separate from the examination rooms. We're equipping them with heat lamps, foot baths, and we have facilities for eye care, too. We have made great strides in our surgical rooms. They're fully equipped to meet practically any emergency. Yes, I see what you mean. As I say, in all the things we've done and are doing, it's almost as though we've been preparing for just such a time of need as this. But what I've just told you is only a part of the whole program. Go on, tell me the rest. Well, we are learning more and more to cut down on occupational disease by control of dust, control of fumes, and we are making great headway in equipping our plant with better dust traps. Fume duct. The medical department has worked hand in hand with the safety engineers. We saw the importance of safety devices, such as color contrast painting on moving parts, safety ramps, overhead conveyor guards, hand guards. 
we also realize the importance of equipping employees with respirators, goggles, safety headdress, safety shoes, whenever necessary. Of having the lighting checked regularly. Of having air conditioning in the plants. And, and this is most important too, the regular inspections in the washrooms and cafeterias. Here's a phase that people seldom think about in its relation to preventive medicine. And that is intelligent, carefully planned medical participation in the induction program for new employees. I had the opportunity of listening in on part of a program just the other day. A good induction program should take into consideration the fact that many of the new employees, especially the women, have never worked in a factory before. You see, I feel that a proper explanation of the whys and wherefores of the safety rules a complete job of conditioning is the first step in preventive medicine. And here again, in the induction of new employees, we've made great progress. A complete and well-planned induction certainly makes sense to me, Doctor. What's more, I'd say your entire medical program is complete. Wouldn't you say so? No, it's not complete. Although we've certainly come a long way. For instance, one of the things we still have to do more work on is selective placement. Getting the right man on the right job, which of course means placing people in jobs they're physically capable of doing. And all that ties in with a part of the work I haven't yet mentioned. To me, it's perhaps one of the most important contributions that industrial medicine can ever make. And that, a broad program for the rehabilitation of the thousands of servicemen already coming back. That is the immediate and urgent job ahead of us. And that is what I'm really going to work on. Once again, we of the American Association of Industrial Physicians and Surgeons are assembled to present our annual award to the man who, during the past year, has made the most outstanding contribution in the field of industrial medicine. This year, that contribution has been a very practical program for the rehabilitation of the returning servicemen. Now, these men need jobs, yes. But it takes more than just a job to carry these injured and war-exhausted men through the critical transition from military to civilian life. It takes a well-planned, carefully executed program of rehabilitation within industry. As you all know, before making our annual award, the committee makes a rather complete and exhaustive study of the work of the recipient we select. We report these findings as a reason for our selection. Tonight, we want to support our choice for the award by a first-hand report. Ladies and gentlemen, I present a fighting Marine with a row of battle ribbons long enough to, well, long enough to make you proud. Ex-Sergeant Harry Brown. I thought I'd seen a lot of doctors when I was overseas, wounded, but tonight, wow. And all looking right at me. It makes a fella kind of nervous. Dr. Calvin asked me to come here tonight to tell you a little something about what's happened to me since I've been back home. Well, after I got back and rested up for a while, I decided to see about getting my old job back at the plant. Mary wasn't too hopeful on account of my game leg, but well, she was cheerful and didn't try to discourage me. Well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't any too cheerful myself. I, I was all confused down inside. I, 
I mean, I, I didn't know how they'd treat me. I didn't know what to expect. I, I was nervous, but I wanted that job. I needed it bad. Well, I, I guess the men at the plant kind of knew how I felt about it. Because during my interview with the personnel director, he made me feel that I was really welcome. Oh, he didn't exactly make me feel like a hero, but, well, maybe it was respect for the uniform I was still wearing. Anyway, he was friendly. He made me feel like an individual, and not just some guy after a job. Next, I talked to the company's employment manager, and I guess he's a pretty smart man, too. Because instead of asking me a lot of questions, we just kind of visited. Before I knew it, I was talking about myself like nobody's business. I guess he found out a lot more about me that way than if I'd had to fill out a lot of long forms. Then I met the doctor and got my physical. And believe me, this physical was complete. I ought to know. By now, I'm an authority on it. The doctor checked me over from head to toe. He x-rayed my chest, checked my blood, and... Well, I guess you doctors know all about that. The doctor made a complete record of my physical shape. And in addition to that, I found out later, he made a lot of notes about my temperament, language, and general attitude. He didn't miss a trick. Well, finally, he gave me an okay for a job. But it was restricted to a job that I could do sitting down and away from a lot of noise. You see, he discovered that I was still jumpy where a lot of loud noises are concerned. Oh, then I showed my medical okay to my coordinator. And he told me how the company puts vets like me into jobs we're best suited for. I took some special aptitude tests that were later checked by an advisory council. Then I went back to my coordinator and he gave me my job. Next, I went to the safety department, and the safety director gave me a lot of instructions about my particular job. And after that, well, after that came my introduction to one of the swellest guys I ever met, my new foreman. Oh, I got along fine. Oh, I was a little slow at first, but I caught on after a while, and Mary sure was happy. I can tell you that. After I'd been on the job for a while, I met several other men who'd been in the service and were working there at the plant. Well, they were getting along fine. You see, the plan doesn't stop with us just getting jobs they think we can do. They have what they call the follow-through system. This means another physical checkup every so often. They follow through to see how we like our jobs, how we're getting on. They just follow through until everybody is sure we feel at home. Just like any other guy on his job. You see, the company realizes that it takes us a little while to make the normal readjustment. To get back into the old swing of normal life. Now, I'll admit that some of us return vets expect too much. Others, not so much. But we're all realizing that the main responsibility of this readjustment thing is ours, personal. All I'm trying to say, and I think I can speak for all the boys who have come back to good, honest jobs, is that a chance to work at a job, well, that's one of the things we fought for. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think I need to say any more as to the value of the work that's been done in the industrial rehabilitation program. Many men throughout the nation have done and are doing superb jobs in industry's rehabilitation program. Their work has been splendid. However, it is my privilege and my pleasure to present the association's annual award to the man who has made 
not only the year's greatest contribution to industrial medicine for outstanding work in veterans rehabilitation, but a man who has throughout the years been a pioneer, an inspiring leader, a builder in the cause of industrial medicine. I present Dr. Kenneth W. Randall. and gentlemen, in accepting this award for which I am grateful and by which I am highly honored, I do so with the full knowledge that I am merely sharing this honor with you and the many, many other industrial physicians throughout the country who are doing so much in the important work of veteran rehabilitation. And as for me being a pioneer in industrial medicine, well, maybe we all were, and still are for that matter. We've come a long way, a long, long way. And the history of modern industrial medicine has been a full one. And when I think back over the years, well, thanks, but what's this for? Doc, I just gotta have a job. It seems that every place I go, they hang off the no help wanted sign. Yes, I know. I can see that you're determined, in spite of my disapproval and disappointment. And nothing I can say will dissuade you. I begin making regular calls to the factory on Monday. Darling, you're wonderful. Yes, I make quite a medical department. Yes, quite a medical department. Usually joy in the back of her. Just fact. Sure, that's what we always do. Ah, yes, I can see it all now. A huge banquet. All the prominent medical men in the country gathered to pay honor and tribute to Dr. Kenneth W. Rand. World renowned. Famous for his great contributions to, uh, to uh, well, something. Of course, you'll be there too with my proud little wife. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I can hear me now as I stand to accept the tremendous ovation and make my acceptance speech. But this isn't the speech I had prepared against such an occasion as this. The speech I had prepared begins, as I recall, all that I am or ever hope to be, I owe to my 